Welcome back to the channel. As you know, this has been UCAP month. So for each of the sections, we've been taking the top 10 most impactful tips for each section and just giving you everything that you need to make sure that you score highly in the test. So today's the quantitative reasoning. Let's not waste any more time and let's just dive straight in. Tip number one is about being economical with your calculations. When you get a question, the first thing that you need to ask yourself is three questions. The first is, do I need to use my calculator for this? Of course, the less you can use your calculator, the more time you can save, the quicker you'll go and if you're good with your mental maths you can be really accurate at the same time. The second question is can I eliminate any answers? With a reasonable amount of mental maths you can eyeball some answers and work out that you can just eliminate some straight away without having to do any calculations. So taking that moment to eliminate any silly answers or working out exactly what you need to calculate can save you some wasted effort. And the final question that you need to ask yourself is do the numbers make sense? So when you do the quick calculations in your head do the numbers make sense with some of the answers that are on offer? Sometimes in the quantitative reasoning the numbers will actually be ridiculous so it might be a foot race that's 3,000 miles long or something that just actually doesn't make sense in the day-to-day -day. but what I mean with by that is just taking a quick picture and saying is this realistic or is the answers the ballpark of what I'm getting at given the numbers that I'm given does that roughly make sense and as I say asking those three questions are going to help you be economical with the actual work that you do to calculate the answers tip number two is around using the calculator now as we said we're trying to eliminate the use of calculator as much as possible but when we do you need to use it we need to make sure that we're efficient with it therefore one of the important things is learning how to use the keyboard shortcuts now I hold my hands up and during the verbal reasoning video which I made here I actually said it was command and C for calculator and I actually just had my Apple brain on but actually it's alt and C for the calculator but the keyboard shortcuts you can use for all things so if you want to go on to the next question it's alt N if you want to flag it's alt F uh, making sure that as well if you're using the calculator, turn the num lock on and you can use the keypad buttons to type in the numbers as well. But the point I want to make with the calculator is that when you're doing it online on a computer screen calculator, it's much slower than if you've got a real calculator at your side and you're punching in the numbers. So when you practice, just make sure, as I always say, simulate the test as much as possible. So use the online calculator that's available on your practice platform and make sure that you're using that rather than getting used to a speedy one being a real one that actually helps you go a lot faster because it's not going to be a true reflection of what it's like in the test. So point three is completely counter to the calculator which is practice your mental maths. Speed and accuracy are so key in this test and the more confidence that you have in your own mental maths the less you're going to have to check stuff the more you can just do things quickly and know that they're right without having to worry or double check or second guess yourself. And I can't stress this enough this out of all of the ten is probably the most important point. If you're not strong at mental maths just try and practice by looking at some YouTube videos with some tricks as to how to do big number calculations in your head because honestly it's the number one tip to help improve your speed and accuracy during this time pressure test. So these points are following a nice little logical order today so number four in the name of speed as we're talking about it be absolutely ruthless with your time. As my friend Kenji Tamita told us when he came to do a guest talk for my inner circle group on the Future Doc Elite program he was telling us how there are purposely some questions in there that are designed to be as he calls impossible possible questions that are purposely there to waste your time and it's how you react to those that's going to impact how much you get through the test and ultimately how much you score. And it goes back to the theme that I've been saying throughout this series that if you score 100% accuracy but only get through 70% of the test you won't score as highly as if you get through the entire thing getting 80% accuracy along the entire completion of that section. So as Kenji said be on the lookout for those impossible questions. So just make sure that you're not shy about flagging, making sure that you guess before because there's no negative marking, and then come back to those when you've got a bit more time at the end, if it allows, so that you can spend the extra time needed to calculate these impossible questions. Of course, they're not impossible, but they will take an impossible amount of time given the time pressure of the test. The next few are going to be some quick tips, but they're really important techniques that you need to make sure that you have down in time for the test. The first one is knowing your fractions. Everybody knows that a half is 50% or 0.5 and 25% for a quarter etc but if you get good at knowing the little ones like knowing that a sixth is 16.66 recurring percent these are the other things that are going to just help save a few seconds here and there when the calculations are a little bit awkward than your more conventional 25% 75% ones. In a similar vein number six is learn your orders of magnitude. This is one that people really struggle to get their head around. If you have a centimeter squared and you convert that to a meter squared people often get confused between the orders of magnitude by which you need to multiply. 
apply. Now I'm gonna explain this really quickly, but if you want to have a look at my online course that goes into depth about all of the sections of the UCAT, we can talk about that there. But very quickly, if you have one centimeter squared and you want to get to one meter squared, it's not just timesing it by 100 the same way that you would do if you were turning one centimeter into a meter. Because it's squared, I want you to imagine that it's little boxes. So one centimeter squared by one centimeter squared box. And if you were to do that for a meter squared, when you think it's 100 by 100, so what you're doing is you're, you're taking one of these little, maybe like say a Lego block of one centimeter by one centimeter, and you have to put not just 100, but you have to put 100 in this row, 100 in this row, 100 in this row, and you're going down to 100 rows of that. So it's not just timesing it by 100, it's timesing it by 100 by 100, so you times it by 100 squared. So that's why when you get from one centimeter squared to one meter squared, you don't times by 100, you times by 100 squared. And if you're thinking cubed, then you're doing exactly the same, except for it's not just the rows up and down, it's the rows to the back as well in 3D. So that was a very quick rudimentary way to try and explain that. But I think if you're struggling, just try and visualize it as blocks of one centimeter squared or cubed and think and try and picture if you were building it, how many you would need to make that. And that will kind of help you understand why it's not just simply timesing by 100 or timesing by a, a simple figure, where it's actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. The other thing that you need to know with orders of magnitude is you need to know and be able to work with all the different orders of 10. So for example, knowing what milli, nano, kilo, giga, all of those things mean and know how to convert between each. Again, another theme that's been throughout this series is to make sure that you know the common questions that come up. If you can know these small subjects in the quantitative reasoning, you'll be in a very good position to score highly. So the common themes that you need to make sure you're on top of are percentages, fractions and decimals, ratios, currency conversions, interest rates, speed, distance and time graphs, volumes, unit conversions, areas and volumes, and then averages. Now again, my online course goes through all of these in depth and teaches you the best techniques for how to answer any questions relating to these. One that they really like a lot is questions related to speed, distance and time. So make sure that you know how to calculate between these. You can use that triangle where you do speed equals distance over time, and then you cover up the one that you want to work out the rest. One of the common tricks is that they might give you the questions in kilometers per hour, and then the answers will be the correct one, but it will be in miles per second or miles per hour or miles per minute, or just some sort of thing that makes it a bit more difficult. So make sure that you're good at not only converting between different orders of magnitude, but also different units. And if you can teach yourself the shortcuts of how to go from meters per second to kilometers per hour, that's going to be a really quick way of multiplying to get in and out of those different conversions. Number eight is look out for common mistakes. These usually arise around percentage changes. This confuses people a lot. And like I say, we've got a whole module on that for the online course, but things such as absolute percentage changes versus relative percentage changes. So if something goes from 20% to 30%, that is a 10% absolute increase, but actually it's a 50% relative increase because it's gone up by 10, which is half of the 20, and that gives you 20 to 30 is the 50% extra that Kate takes you and makes the difference. And then silly things that people make is for when they want 90%, they might be tempted to divide by 1.1, which isn't the same as timesing by 0.9, which is the correct way to get a 90% of a value. Number nine is it's really important to know the difference between your averages. So know the difference between mean, which is all of the numbers added together divided by the number of numbers, the median, which is when you put the numbers in order, which is the middle one, and then the mode, which is when you put them in order, which is the most common number. Number 10 and the final point is to make sure that you know really well your geometrical formulae. So you'll get lots of shapes, volumes, areas, and be asked to work them out and then add them together. So make sure that you know all the common ones and how to calculate them. So I'll quickly put a table on the screen now of the common ones and how to calculate them. So things like knowing what a square is, knowing how to calculate a rectangle, a parallelogram, a circle, a triangle. Those are quite straightforward. But then when you want to work out 3D shapes, learning how to do a box, a sphere, a cylinder, and then even working out how to calculate cone shapes, all really common things that come up. And if you know the equations really quickly, then it really helps with that. One thing we get asked a lot about is pi. Usually you will be given the figure of pi and it will usually be three to make calculations easy because doing things the way they do in the quantitative reasoning it's not very practical to do pi to the ridiculous number of decimals that it exists to. So usually they will simplify it by just saying use three as pi, or they might even give it in representative
representations of pi. So it'll be 36 pi or 12 pi or, or whatever it is that they represent it with the answers. So to give you a bit more help with the quantitative reasoning, I've just made a brand new playlist here with loads of videos, practice questions, and other stuff that you can do to practice. Otherwise, you can go through my online course where we have literally all of these things covered to make sure that no stone is left unturned to teach you everything you know to score highly in the test. Otherwise, if you want to check out some of the other videos in this series, you can check out my top 10 tips for another subject here. But otherwise, thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you in one of those videos. Woo! Dun, dun, da, 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 dun, dun, dun.